Okay, so uh, let's uh, get started where we stopped last time. So let's recall, uh, first of all, what we want to prove. This is Hormandas theorem, uh, which states the following. So we are given a domain omega in C, and phi is a real valued C2 function on omega, such that um, there exists a constant C greater than zero, such that the Laplacian of phi is greater than or equal to C. Then, if g is a measurable function on omega, is such that the integral of g squared e to the power minus phi dv on omega is finite, there exists u such that du over dz bar is equal to g, and we have the L2 estimate, integral over omega, absolute value of u squared e to the power minus phi dv is less than or equal to 1 over c, integral over omega, length of g squared e to the power minus phi dv. This is our goal. And uh, what we have done till now, okay, done the, the functional analysis lemma, and which says the following. So T from H1 to H2 is a closed, densely defined uh, operator. alpha is in H2, and let's not call it C today, I'll rename it K, K greater than zero, are such that we have norm of T star beta is greater than or equal to, so I have to be careful here, K, one over K, length of uh, the absolute value beta for every beta in the domain of T star. So once this happens, we can, so this is the hypothesis, and this implies there exists u in the domain of T, such that, uh, T of u is uh, equal to the given one, which I am calling alpha, and the length of u is less than or equal to c. Right? So this, I think we have already understood why this is the case. Okay, thank you very much. I was just, <laughs> okay. Uh, we also introduced the operator d bar of a stopgap thing because I didn't have the notation, but draw introduced it today, so we are uh, from L2 omega phi to L2 omega phi, okay? So what is this guy? Uh, first of all, what is L2 omega phi? This is the Hilbert space of functions f, which are square integrable with respect to the weight phi, and this is what that means. Obviously, uh, the norm in this space, the norm will be denoted with a subscript phi, is exactly this quantity. Let me write it down once. And the corresponding inner product is the integral over omega of f times g conjugate e to the power minus phi dv. And how does one define this operator? The domain of d bar consists of those f in uh, L2 omega phi such that if you take df over dz bar uh, in the sense of distribution, then it also lies in L2 omega phi. Let us very quickly remind ourselves what this uh, in the sense of distribution means. So, to to say 
that df over dz bar equal to g, which is locally integrable. In this case, we have L2 functions with respect to some continuous weight. Definitely, they are locally integrable uh, as distributions means that uh, for, so I have unfortunately used up uh, phi. So therefore, for all chi, which are compactly supported smooth functions on the domain omega, we have the obvious relation uh, that df over dz bar e dv over omega. So uh, I, I'm calling it g now. is minus uh, f times d phi over d z bar d v over omega. So all the properties of distributional derivatives and stuff that we are referring to chi. Too many letters. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, all the properties uh, come from there. Okay. So about this d bar, About my big D bar, it is quite easy to see and that this is a closed and densely defined. Densely defined, we have already discussed why this is the case. Densely defined and closed is a simple consequence of this definition, so which I leave it to you as an exercise. Okay. Yes, that is actually important. So I'm not saying that uh, the, the, the partial derivatives df over dx and df over dy exist in any sense. The, only this inequality is satisfied, yes. Yeah. Okay. Therefore, d is a good candidate, d bar, to apply the functional analysis lemma. And that's what we are going to do. That's the basic plan. To do that, I need to understand the adjoint of this operator. So, yes, yes, like any other uh, L2 space. So you can think of this guy, where is L2 omega phi uh, over here? You can think of this as a measure, a measure which is absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure, right? And you know that given any measure, the L2 space generated by it is complete, right? The Ries Fisher theorem or whatever. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so now we want to understand this guy, what it is. Okay. So, what I know already from abstract theory is that this thing, which is a mapping also, so here we have uh, set ourselves up for confusion because this, yes? Is that right? But I, that is why I put the phone here. Some, there, there's some buzzing sound, right? Yeah, I heard that when you were lecturing too. Whatever. Yeah. Everybody can hear me all right, right? So, this uh, D bar star is uh, by general theory. If you were more careful, I would have given different names to the source and the target. This one is actually the, um, so this, you recall if T is a mapping from H1 to H2, then T star is a mapping from H2 to H1. So here they take the same, you know, they're the same, so there's not, a, uh, not an issue there, okay? What we already know that this D bar star is a densely defined, Closed operator. So we will prove two very simple facts about D bar star, which will suffice to uh, for uh, our purposes. The first thing we want to understand is that if you look at C infinity with compact support functions, these are contained in the domain of D bar star. So, and, and, if, let's say, alpha belongs to C infinity with compact support omega, 
then d bar star of alpha is minus uh, d alpha over dz plus d phi phi right yeah d phi over dz times alpha so it is a differential operator but it also has a zeroth order term unlike d bar itself uh, this can also be written and it is sometimes helpful to write it as minus e to the power phi uh, d over dz of e to the power minus phi times alpha. Okay. All right, so let us check why this is the case. So uh, let alpha be in uh, C infinity with compact support omega and beta be in the domain of uh, uh, d bar. And then, of course, we will need to consider now d bar beta comma alpha and take the inner product. Okay. So, uh, what is that? That is, by definition, the integral over omega of d beta over d z bar, an L2 function, uh, times alpha bar uh, times e to the power minus phi dv. And uh, since this is like a compactly supported function, I can easily integrate by parts. The boundary term disappears. And what you get is, so let me write this down, integral over omega. So first I have beta, then I have d over dz bar of alpha bar e to the power minus phi dv, which is not you know, good enough for my purpose because I want to write it as an inner product with respect to phi. Okay. Not actually That's your definition. That's my definition of d bar. Thank you very much. Okay, yes, yes. We, we call all such processes integration by parts. But here, exactly what, as 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 Dot pointed out, what we are doing here is using this definition. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So. This is therefore equal to, so let me be, uh, let me try to be careful here, integral over omega minus uh, e to the power phi uh, d over dz alpha e to the power minus phi and take the bar of this whole thing e to the power minus phi dv, which is therefore the inner product of, let's give this a name, beta and gamma of phi, where gamma is exactly this thing, minus e to the power minus phi uh, d over dz uh, alpha e to the power minus phi. Okay. So what this shows now is if you look at the map which sends alpha to d bar beta comma alpha, okay, this is also the map alpha uh, gamma, which means this is bounded. Which means immediately that alpha is in the domain of the buster. Right? So that was the definition of domain of the adjoint. Right? And uh, d bar star of uh, alpha, therefore, is exactly by definition, um, I, I did I, uh, what did I do here? The beta is there, so it's beta comma gamma, right? Yeah, it's beta comma gamma. Uh, beta goes to, thank you. So uh, by, by this time I have already confused. Beta goes to this, yes. This is bounded. So therefore this is beta comma gamma, yeah. And uh, by definition, d bar star of alpha is gamma, which is exactly given by this formula. So I, I have therefore substantiated both claims. Okay. So now this thing has a name. This is called the formal adjoint. This is, this d bar star is, uh, well, it is the adjoint, but restricted to the compactly supported forms. So this is called the formal adjoint of the operator. Uh, capital D bar, and we have just computed the formal adjoint. Name of, uh, Say that again? Name of, huh. I think the 
Ah, D. Barstar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. The other thing that we want to say is that, in fact, uh, C infinity with compact support omega is dense in uh, domain, and now I'll be extremely careful, D bar star, with respect to the graph norm. So recall what the graph norm was. So um, the graph norm of f, just write graph here, is basically the norm of f with respect to phi and the norm of d bar star f with respect to phi for f in domain of d bar star. So this is one of the points where uh, we have the advantage disadvantage of one complex variable because the analogous statement is not the, the analogous statement in several variables is going to be much more complicated but right now we have this and we'll take advantage of the simplicity of this statement okay so how does one show this so um, so sufficient to show the following so if suppose some uh, G uh, is perpendicular okay to uh, this uh, c infinity with uh, compact support omega in domain of this is with respect to the graph norm in domain of uh, okay so my notation is like this d bar star then g is zero right if uh, something is orthogonal to a dense subspace, then it must vanish. But that is just basically a computation. So let us uh, just uh, quickly try to do that. So uh, so take alpha in uh, C infinity with compact support omega. So this guy here simply means that G alpha with respect to phi plus uh, D bar star G D bar star alpha with respect to phi is zero. Now we use the, uh, I want to call integration by parts, but basically it is the definition of the, uh, the weak derivative. This is the same as saying G plus uh, D bar, D bar star G alpha phi equal to zero. Uh, with uh, as uh, action of uh, distributions which means in the phi norm there is no doubt that these guys are dense which means that g plus d bar d bar star g equal to zero as distributions however However, this also means that d bar, d bar star g is minus g, which is in L2, which implies that d bar star g is in the domain of d bar. Okay. I, since I cannot cross this, I'll just erase here and uh, finish this here. I'll erase this. So, I can now try to compute, let me see, yeah, so I can now try to compute G, uh, D, uh, G plus, G plus D bar, D bar star G, G, which is, of course, G, G phi plus D bar, d bar star g g but now since i know that uh, this g guy belongs to the domain of uh, this this guy belongs to the domain of d bar i can actually integrate by parts
So therefore, this is the graph norm of G square, which is zero, which means that G is zero. So that's a kind of a soft argument which suffices uh, in this particular case. So we have two things. So we have, first of all, uh, we know what is d bar star on a nice space of uh, functions. There I know how to calculate it explicitly. And we have the following crucial information that this nice space of functions is dense in the graph norm, in the full space. So in some sense, this suffices to understand d bar star for our purposes, okay? All right, now we come to, with these preliminaries, we are now ready to introduce our next thing. So, this is the formal Bochner Kodaira identity, which in this case is just a triviality, but which will uh, take a more uh, detailed form later as we go to hi higher dimensions. So we claim that for all f, uh, c2 of omega, okay, now, um, yeah, d bar, d bar star f is d bar star d bar f plus the Laplacian of phi times f. So, uh, just a calculation, just quickly do that to verify that this is uh, indeed the case. So, um, so let's compute the left hand side. Okay. So, so the way you define this D bar operator is distribution along. Yes. And the way you define these adjoints, um, the formal adjoints just act on the same form. Yes. So strictly speaking, this is not, you can't apply D bar star to that. Okay, I'll just make it a compactly supported one. Okay, I'll make it smooth. The point is that I wanted to emphasize is that this D bar star is a particular operator you get by abstract nonsense. But in fact, what you prove is that it's given by a differentiation formula. Yes. So that's the object called the formal action. It actually differentiates. It's no longer like an abstract Hilbert space. It's just, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, okay, maybe maybe I should even say, okay, so what, with that one, this is just an algebraic identity between differential operators. Yeah, that's a very important point, and that's a completely general phenomenon, that if you take any differential operator and take its formal adjoint, that is also, also a uh, differential operator, in fact, of the uh, same order. Okay, so let's uh, compute this guy. Uh, yeah, so in fact, in honor of these statements, I will say, uh, apply it to uh, the distributions even. <laughs> so the left hand side is therefore d over dz bar um, as an operator, and then this guy is minus df over dz plus um, d phi over dz times f, okay? And if you calculate that, that is going to be minus d square um, uh, f dz bar dz plus we'll, we're going to get two terms. The first one is Laplacian of phi times f, which I already see here. And the other one is going to uh, differentiate this guy. So I'll have d phi over dz times df over dz. Right? So that is the left hand side. And I only need to compute this. Z bar, thank you. I only need to compute this part. So this is therefore uh, minus d over dz plus d phi over dz dot acting on df over d uh, z bar, which therefore gives me 
minus d square f over dz dz bar plus uh, d phi over dz times df over dz bar and we are done right okay, that's it. all right so i have the formal Bachner codide identity then what do i do with it From this, I see the following. So I'll call this step A. Uh, all these steps we will go over again in several variables so that we know what we are talking about. So I will call this the integral Wachner Kodaira identity, which is also very simple in this particular case. So let us take this formula. So let us take this formula, call it 1, and uh, take a function f, which is c infinity with compact support on omega, and, apply, uh, and, and take the inner product on both sides with this f. So this is true, and uh, this side I have d bar star d bar f, f phi and then the last one is Laplacian phi f f phi. Just multiply and inter, multiply, it, put the e to the power minus phi and integrate. Okay, But then what is this? I can surely move this to the other side and that will give me the norm of d bar star f phi squared is and if you move it to the other side again, uh, you will get square, and then this will remain unchanged. I have some colored chalk here, so let me take advantage of that. So uh, this is my first boxed formula, and from that I have this second box formula, which is integrated version, so the integral bochner kodaira identity, okay? So now I come to C. Recall what we assumed about phi. So the Laplacian of phi is greater than or equal to C, which is itself greater than zero. So that wisdom we actually never used till uh, this point. We used that it was smooth, but we never used the fact that the Laplacian was strictly positive. So if we use that here, I get the following. I get norm of d bar star f phi squared is, um, uh, is greater than or equal to, I can ignore this one, this is positive, and you are left with norm of, uh, I'll just write this write the steps here, is greater than or equal to integral over omega Laplacian of phi absolute value of f square e to the power minus phi dv, but this is greater than or equal to c, so therefore this thing is greater than or equal to c times norm of f phi squared. So what we have shown is that the following inequality holds. So for each f with compact support, we have the inequality norm of d bar star f phi squared is greater than or equal to c times uh, norm of f phi squared. So this is another one that will find a blue box for itself. So this is the a priori estimate on d bar star. At this point, we would like to use the functional analysis lemma. We're all, you know, we're very similar. We don't have an inner product here, but it, it looks similar. But there is a small problem that this inequality must hold for every element in the domain of t star, okay? which is not quite the case here, because 
here this has been shown only for things which have compact support but it is not a big deal by uh, one of the things we uh, we have there so c d but c infinity with compact support omega is dense in graph norm in domain of d bar star. What does that mean? That is, if f is in the domain of d bar star, there exists a sequence fj in uh, c infinity with compact support omega such that it converges in the graph law which is which 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 means that fj goes to f in uh, l2 omega phi and at the same time d bar star fj goes to d bar star f in l2 omega phi right? that's what it means but then each fj does have compact support Since fj is smooth with compact support, we have the a priori estimate available. And now let j go to infinity. By the two uh, facts there, I immediately see that uh, for all f in domain of uh, d bar star, we indeed have uh, the d bar star f norm phi squared is greater than or equal to c times norm of f phi squared. So this is my this box formula. So this is the basic estimate of L2 theory in its one variable and very simple uh, manifestation. Okay, so now with this estimate, we are actually ready to prove our result. So let's do that. So let us look at the right hand side G. So recall that G belongs to L2 of um, omega phi, right? So therefore what happens is I can do the following. Uh, I can look at, so for all F in domain of D bar star, what I have from there is that uh, I have a norm of t bar star f phi squared is greater than or equal to, so c, okay. so I have to somehow include this g, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in the denominator, okay, so let's assume that g is not zero. If g is zero, there is nothing to prove because I can take u to be zero. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> that's right. Yes, 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 yes. That's right. So let, let's put this thing here. Okay. And uh, then uh, what we have here is length of f phi squared, length of g phi squared. But then we can use the Cauchy Schwarz inequality to say that this is greater than or equal to c times length of g phi squared times uh, the inner product of f and g 
uh, in the phenom squared. I, I do this so that I have exact parallelism with what uh, we have there. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, of course. Okay, so, so the hypothesis of the functional analysis lemma are satisfied with, so let's see, T is uh, this uh, D bar, okay? Alpha is a G, and uh, K, I think I called it K there, yeah. K is C over length of G phi squared. Ah, exactly, exactly, so 1 over k, which implies there exists u in L2 omega phi such that uh, d bar u is g and the length of u in the phi norm is um, uh, 1 over k, so therefore, uh, it is, let's not equal to k actually, yes. So 1 over c, uh, uh, the square is not here, so the k in that notation is square root of c. Yeah. <laughs> so this square is length of g phi square, and we are done. Is that clear? So basically, this is the same argument that will be used over and over again in all these applications. However, in uh, other applications, there will be some complications which will come in, and we'll look into them later. But right now, let us uh, look at a few things about this estimate. The first thing, and this is very important, is we have sort of cheated here because we are in one variable. We have used highly non uh, invariant language. So it is therefore very important to rewrite this in an invariant way. So what, what would be an invariant expression of this? So, so first of all, let us write down the formula again. So d bar, d bar star f is d bar star d bar f uh, plus Laplacian of phi times f. So this, this thing is easy to understand. After all, uh, when we take a derivative, uh, the, the correct way to think about a derivative is like a linear map. So instead of doing this, what we should do is what Dor was talking about. So this, we should rather use this d bar f, which is df over dz bar, dz bar. So therefore, uh, this, uh, 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 this, uh, this d bar here, for example, it acts on a function, right? And uh, this must be replaced by this. So there, this corresponds to taking d bar, and therefore this must correspond to taking d bar star with respect to phi of f. Uh, let's not call it f, let's call it alpha, where alpha is f d z bar. So the invariant way of looking at the left hand side would be to uh, think of this f as the only coefficient of a zero one form, and you are hitting with uh, this uh, d bar star phi, which gives me a function, and then I am again acting with d bar, which gives me a zero one form. So uh, let me write down the expression for uh, this guy. So we already saw that this d bar f was this d bar f times d z bar. And if I look at, uh, maybe I'll put alpha uh, f here, that's fine. And if I look at this d bar star of f d z bar, that turns out to be nothing but d bar star uh, of uh, f, 
and that's it, right? That's a function. Is it clear? So I, the left hand side can only mean this. Okay. Let's look at this guy. Let's look at this guy. What is this doing? We are taking d bar of f. So this, what is this f? This alpha is a one form, which is an invariant object. And what we are doing here is we are differentiating this coefficient of the one form. So uh, usually when one differentiates a one form, uh, in, in this case, in, uh, uh, one should take the exterior derivative. But in this case, the exterior derivative is 0. But we are not doing that. We are just looking at the derivative of the coefficient. So the invariant way of thinking about that is that what we are looking at is uh, df over dz bar, dz bar. We are not wedging anymore, but tensoring with dz bar. So therefore, this d bar f over here is we are actually, what we are doing here is we are, um, so maybe I'll put it here. We are taking the covariant derivative of the form alpha. So our, my form alpha was f dz bar, and we are taking the covariant derivative with respect to the, you know, the flat metric or whatever, and that would precisely be alpha bar perhaps. We are only interested in the zero one part, this guy. So therefore, I have identified this part. And this must be its adjoint. So therefore, there I have this. Now, this part is more tricky. So what is this? So that turns out to, in invariant terms, the curvature of the trivial line bundle with uh, the metric e to the power minus phi. But in practice, it is given only by this Laplacian. Okay. I'll keep it just like that for now, except that it acts on this form alpha. So therefore, here I have, oh, this should be blue. That is the blue one, yeah. So this is, Invariant expression for the Bochner Kodaira formula. Okay, so uh, finally, I want to uh, look at three simple uh, uh, extensions of this result, all of which have higher dimensional analogs, so we'll just uh, note them. Three extensions. So in the theorem that we proved, we assumed that uh, this Laplacian of phi was greater than or equal to c, which was itself greater than 0. What happens if phi in C2 omega is such that uh, this uh, is positive? Of course, as usual, phi is real valued. So then, for all g in L2, ah, I need to be careful. All measurable g such that, so now I need another bound, there exists u, uh, this time in L2 omega phi, such that du over dz bar is g, and uh, we have the estimate so this uh, is one of the homework exercises. And it is proved basically the same way as we did the other one, except that uh, the spaces H1 and H2 have to be different, and we have to use this for H2. But it is basically the same thing, so I'll just uh, say that. The next one I want to say, so this is the first extension. Uh, 
Yes. Only positive. Only positive. Yes. Exactly. That's even need to be positive. That's also. That it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, yeah. Something like that, yeah. And this actually has very important applications. So therefore, you know, it's important to note here. The second one is the following observation. So now we will assume omega bounded. Okay. And let delta be one half its diameter. That is one half the soup of uh, mod of z minus w, where z w both belong to omega, which is finite because this omega guy is bounded. Then for all g, which are just L2 of omega, I have eliminated the weight, okay. There exists u, which is also in L2 of omega, such that uh, du over dz bar is equal to g, and uh, norm of u, just the ordinary L2 norm of u, is less than or equal to square root of e times delta times norm of g. Let's see why this is the case. So we choose a particular weight. Uh, okay, first before you do that, without loss of generality, without loss of generality, uh, the domain omega is contained in the ball or disk rather centered at zero at radius delta. Right? That is because this estimate is clearly invariant under translations. So the norms and uh, nothing changes. And uh, you choose phi. to be 1 over delta square times uh, mod of z squared. So 1 over delta square is to make it scale invariant, so that you know if you have different uh, sizes. So then observe that the Laplacian of phi is basically 1 over delta square. Our Laplacian is the z derivative and the z bar derivative. So there's no factor of 2 or anything. OK, so therefore what happens is now, there exists u by Hormander such that integral of mod u square e to the power minus uh, z square over delta square dv uh, such that, of course, it satisfies this equation. And this is less than or equal to integral over omega of uh, length of g square e to the power minus mod z squared over delta squared uh, dv. Okay. So, so on uh, observe further about this phi, uh, on omega, on omega we have that phi of z uh, is, uh, or rather I, I'm more interested in e to the power minus mod z squared over delta squared. It is certainly uh, certainly less than or equal to 1, but greater than or equal to 1 over t, right? Because as z approaches the boundary of omega, this becomes minus 1. So therefore, this thing here is greater than or equal to 1 over e times integral over omega uh, mod u squared dv. And this thing over here is less than or equal to integral over omega g squared dv, and we are done. Ah, from delta square. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Yes. 1 over c. Yes. OK, and the last one, so this was the second extension. And the last one is 
what happens if my weight phi is uh, allowed to be uh, uh, norm smooth? This also has applications. In this case, it's very simple. So first of all, I have to tell you what it means for a non-smooth subharmonic function to, uh, to be strictly subharmonic. So number three. So let phi be a subharmonic function. So in general, subharmonic functions need not be even continuous. They're just upper semi-continuous. And by the sub-mean value property, it follows that they're locally integrable. But we cannot say anything better than that. Subharmonic function on a domain omega in C such that uh, there exists capital C greater than zero such that uh, phi minus C mod Z squared is still subharmonic. Then, for all G in L2 omega phi, there exists U also in L2 omega phi, such that du over dz bar is G, and uh, integral of mod U squared e to the power minus phi dv is less than or equal to 1 over c times integral. So the same conclusion as in uh, Hormann. So how is this done? So basically the idea is to instead of looking at omega, you look at slightly smaller domains, slightly smaller uh, domains. And then one can smoothen this subharmonic function by convolving it with a radial uh, mollifier, so which gives smooth subharmonic functions. And then we still have that the Laplacian is strictly greater than or greater than or equal to C. Okay? So you apply, so you solve the problem on the smaller domains, and uh, thanks to the Hohlmann itself, you get a uniform bound on these solutions, and then uh, then one can sort of take a weak limit of these solutions using Alaoglu's theorem, and at the end of the day, you end up with this, uh, this thing. Okay? So therefore, the smoothness of uh, the uh, weight phi is not really important, so that can be relaxed. At least in this case, when smoothing out the subharmonic function is not a problem. Okay. I think uh, with that I will stop, and uh, next day we will have a crash course on SCV. Yes. Can I make a couple of Yes, please, yeah. First of all, the proof you gave of the Hormander, yeah. That's right. And so, in fact, you don't even need to regularize it. That identity at the level of distribution will already be good enough. Uh, you, you, of course, need to know that the Laplacian of phi exists as a positive uh, function, which is true for subharmonic functions. Yes. Yeah, that, that one has to know. Yeah, ideally, don't need to do this. That is true. No, oh, that's, I didn't, yeah. didn't really occur yeah. before. That. That's, that's a very interesting. Uh, yes. And then the other thing. I would say is um, so it's very important in this number three. Number three, the really much more important result that uh, number that Hormander's theorem which looks like the same result, but this is for possibly singular weight. And the point is that even though the function c, as Debraj said, uh, is is locally integrable if it's subharmonic and not identical. He said you can't say anything more. I, I would say so a lot more. Uh, it's much better than local integrable. It, it only has logarithmic singularity. But it's it's uh, it's a relatively well behaved function, but e to the minus p is not. So e to the minus p. So for example, you could take uh, a million times the logarithm of mod p squared, which is p. Uh, and that is very nice locally integrable. You can compute its Laplacian and satisfies um, so if you could if you take, for example, mod p squared plus uh, a million times the logarithm of mod p squared, and that's one of these functions. 
But if you look at each of the minus p in the denominator, there's mod z to the power of two million. And so it means that as long as you have data g, uh, which vanishes to order two million, order a million along the origin, then that integral on the right will be finite. And therefore your solution u will also have to vanish to that same order. Mm -hmm. And so it actually allows you to prescribe the zero of the solution as long as you have a wave that's very, very similar. And that that was invent that was invented by somebody who essentially got a field medal for Bombieri. I use it in a famous paper on numbers. And it's been a very important tool in complex geometry. Yeah. Okay, so we'll stop here today and uh, tomorrow be prepared for uh, one uh, one hour long crash course on uh, several complex variables. I hope both all, all parties survive. <laughs>